So uh, I've just got uh, some photographs, some scriptures, and uh, you know, hopefully it gives you a little flavor of what we experienced over the last few weeks and a few good points from the Holy Spirit for us to take away with us in the middle of the week. So this is, I was, I was on, on a prayer walk early one morning to uh, escape the intense heat. I had all my walks either early in the morning or when it was cool enough in the evening. And uh, my first point, this is a bunch of little ants that I encountered on the way, building a, 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 a big ant hill or something, which I'm sure somebody's going to clean up because it's, you know, it's on the pavement. Um, but uh, consider the ant is my first point. Consider the ant, you know. It's, uh, it was quite amazing to, uh, you know, be out there in that sun. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't, when, when, you, when you come to England, the first thing that strikes you is how green everything is. And, uh, you know, even when we have, like, drought alerts and host pipe bans, so, you know, sometimes you see brown grass, but you still see trees and bushes and, you know, so many other things that are very green in this country. And, uh, but when you're there, um, it seems like everything that lives sort of fights for life, you know. And uh, so these, uh, these ants were, you know, very impressive. Consider the ants, you sluggard. Um, you know, that, that, that verse is in, in the book of Proverbs, and uh, the writer goes on and says, the ant has no overseer, it has no ruler, it has no manager, it has no one, you know, holding, holding it to account, but it still gathers its food in, in, uh, in summer and uh, then enjoys it in the harvest or something like that, you know. But, uh, um, you know, um, that, there is something about the ant that has a sense of timing, that doesn't waste time, that doesn't delay things till tomorrow. And um, there's a lesson we can learn from that. Um, the New Testament tells us something very, very similar. Maybe we could have a look at uh, Ephesians 4. And um, Paul, in telling us about the spiritual life, um, puts it in, uh, in this way. Uh, oh, sorry, Ephesians 5 and verse 15 says, um, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. So, you know, the, the, uh, the older translations, instead of make the most of every opportunity, it says, redeem the time. Redeem the time. To redeem means to buy back. It's a word that was used um, when, you know, a, a, a slave would be set free from slavery. Um, the price that would be paid for that was redemption. And when we say Jesus died for our redemption, it means literally his life was paid for us to be set free from slavery to sin and to Satan. And with, with that in mind, Paul tells us as Christians, you know, redeem the time. The, 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 you know, we, we, if I look back at my life, um, even as a Christian, actually, um, there's not many regrets I have because God's, God's blessed and even the difficult times are, you know, they, they were used by God. But if I was to ponder and think about, well, is there something I regret? Um, maybe, I mean, I have to think about it some more, but maybe number one is there were, um, you know, there were years when um, I could have used the time better. There were years when I could have used the time better. And um, like the ant, um, you know, maybe even with that picture in his mind, Paul says as Christians, we should be people who, who redeem the time, who make the most of the time. And... Um, you know, I think, I, I think the last midweek I taught before I left was called what, what is a Christian or something like that. What does it mean to be a Christian? And, you know, when we, when we think about how all of the amazing promises in the Bible, the, the call of God all the way from Adam um, and then made new in Christ, that call to be a people who walk with him and who are, you know, doing our part to get ourselves ready for an eternity of living with God and, uh, you know, ruling the earth with him, under him, um, for good, for good, for his glory 
and for the benefit of all of creation. Um, when we think about those things, it inspires me to want to, you know, use the time, to make the most of the time. One of the ways, you know, when I, when I was away in, um, in America, one thing that happened this time was I never fully adjusted to the local time zone. I think in all of the three weeks, there were probably, I mean, at the most, a handful of mornings when I woke up at anything approximating normal wake-up time. Almost every day, I was awake at about 3 a.m. But one of the benefits of that was I got to see the stars in the sky night after night in a way that I, I haven't ever in, in my whole life, I think, you know, that, that, uh, that often. And, uh, um, I mean, it's amazing. When you, when you go out and when you look and when you, it, it, it brings praise from your heart, you know. And, uh, and then as, as, as night turns to day and the various, you know, birds and wildlife start to, uh, uh, start to awaken, awaken us, um, there's a majesty about creation that, uh, that, that, that brings out praise in our hearts. And, uh, you know, he says here, make, make the most, make the most of the opportunity. And, our, you know, let's, let's do that. Let's, let's take that to heart. Um, what he's saying to us here is, let's really be serious, just as the ant is. Let's, let's do the thinking. Let's remind ourselves. And let's keep in our hearts, um, you know, the, the, the importance of just all that God has called us to um, and make the most of the time like those wonderful little ants. Okay? Now this here is, so, so um, when, you, when you land in Phoenix and look around, it looks like a place that uh, is, is, you know, um, you could be forgiven for thinking you were in a different planet except that there are houses and people and, you know, things that you recognize. Um, uh, for me, all of the, the area kind of reminds me of oh, the only, the closest, when I landed there, the closest thing that I could relate to was um, Western movies that I saw when I was a boy, which are not that popular now, you know, but um, desert and, and the cactuses were amazing, okay? And so this is a close-up, and the thing that is amazing on this cactus is um, the design of it. So it's, you know, the, the prickly spine things that it has, um, I mean, I don't know. It's probably pretty easy to guess. That's kind of protective, you know, um, so that it doesn't get eaten before it grows or whatever. But the thing that's amazing is it's almost like some, some, someone who was an expert in needlework went and made this thing, you know, because all of those, it looks like they've been placed in exact um, sort of uh, distances from each other. And they're all on the crest of the ridges, and none of them are on the, you know, the, the, the troughs, the in-between, the valleys of the, of, the, of the ridges. And it's pretty amazing. You know, point number two, God has made it plain. Lessons from the desert. Point number two, God has made it plain. When I look at uh, Romans 1, um, Paul uh, begins by talking about, um, you know, what, what happened, what has happened to the world and what happens in, in, uh, in life when people turn away from God. And um, uh, it says in, uh, in verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Um, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Okay, now I've read this, these verses so many times in my life and I must confess, when I was much younger, I would read them, but I would think about, I would think about just how persuasive, um, you know, everything is that I have learned in school and in science and I would think about people that I studied the Bible with and um, just the way that for them, even looking at all of creation was, is not exactly um, persuasive about the fact that, you know, there, since there is a design, there must be a designer, you know. But the more and more, as the years go by, the more and more I look at it, certain things become abundantly clear. 
And one of those is that God didn't just leave a little bit of proof that he made everything. God didn't just leave a little bit of proof, you know. Um, when you, you, or you could be anywhere in the world. You could be in Ealing or in Hounslow or in Acton or in Northolt or anywhere we live. You could go on a walk in a place that is very, very built up and not exactly brimming with, you know, the natural beauty that we have when you get out of the city, you know, and so on. But no matter where you are, there's, you know, a lavish abundance of evidence of God's goodness and his work, you know. You, it's even on a built-up street, um, you go past a few hedges and you see so many different types of leaves that are all different from each other, you know. You see so many um, different types of flowers and, we and weeds, right? Um, you, he, God didn't make just a few stars. He made countless numbers of stars, you know. Um, then when we think about how everything works together, and I, you've heard me share this from time to time, um, the number of different things that have to work together just so that you and I can sit in this room and talk about God or about whatever we want to talk about without ever thinking about all the things that have to collude together um, is astonishing, you know? It is astonishing. We're, we're breathing without thinking about it, but th the way that our bodies are made and our lungs are made is um, really quite exquisite, you know? The, the, the composition of the air that we breathe is just perfect. Some of, some of the nutrients, the gases that are in the air, were manufactured by stars, the stars that I was looking at in the sky at 3 a.m. when I was jet lagged um, in Phoenix. Um, you know, those stars, the, when, um, when they die, when they end their lives, they produce, it's like a factory. They produce, um, there are explosions that produce gases that show up in our Earth's atmosphere that mix with other gases without which it would be impossible for us to live. We do that every single moment. Every, we're not, you know, where you're sitting on your seat without for a moment fearing that you might suddenly start floating in the air because gravity wouldn't be perfect, you know. There are so many things that work together um, that I think it, it really is true, you know. Men are without excuse since what may be known about God is plain since God has made it plain. I shared about this some, um, a couple of months ago when we came back from India, but I'll just, maybe for those that weren't there, um, or for those of us that were, as a reminder, there was a, um, when we were in India, one day I was on a prayer walk, and uh, I, I saw a father and a son. The father must have been in his 30s. The son looked like he was about seven or eight, and they were going for a walk, I guess before, before he was going to work and the boy was going to school or something like that. And... Uh, the place where we were walking, on one side was a built-up area of, of houses. And on the other side was just, you know, a big field and some hills not too far away. And um, it was full of natural beauty, okay? And uh, the, as, the the, as the father and the son were walking, the, the, I, I kid you not, the little boy said to, they were speaking in Hindi to each other, and the little boy said to his dad, he said, Dad, Dad, I've got it, I've got it. And the dad's like, you know, probably thinking about his work meetings and I, I think he had a stick in his mouth, you know, kind of look, looking a little bit bored or whatever. But the boy goes on and he says, Dad, I, I get it. He points to all the houses. He said, all this was made by men. And he said, but all of that, and he points to all the hills, you know, and the, and the natural beauty he says, all of that was made by God. And the dad's like, this dad is like some dopey dad. I would be so fired up if my seven-year-old kid said something like that, you know. The dad's chewing away, and uh, okay, you know. And, he said, and the, he said it again. He said, no, no, dad, listen, all of this was made by men, but all of that was made by God. And, you know, it, it made me think, you know, the normal thing that if, 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 a, if a child was not told um, that, um, you know, according to the best wisdom of the world today, everything we see made itself, very clever. That's, that, that surely is not very clever, right? But, but if, if, if people aren't taught, the natural assumption is, okay, man, there's so much amazing things that we see. 
Surely somebody must have made it. Who made all of this must be the most normal question to come out of a human heart, you know? And, um, and so, you know, let's... Uh, but, so, what does that mean for us if you're an old Christian, if you've been around for a long time, you know? What does that mean to us? Well, you know, I think we too need to be um, affirmed and helped and, you know, happy and confident in, as we look around at creation and, you know, to be able to be reminded every single day, listen, God is real. He has made it plain. He's extraordinarily wise and loving and powerful. And he is my God. In fact, um, why don't we look at someone and just next to you and say, say this after me. Look at someone next to you. Say, God is very wise. God is very powerful. God is very loving. And he is your God. Amen to that. All right? All right. Point three. God helps us in our weakness. God helps us in our weakness. Okay, this amazing God helps us in our weakness. Let's uh, move over a few pages to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. And uh, let's read uh, verse 22. Romans 8, 22 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So, you know, have you ever wondered why? I mean, how come in general we see beauty and power and organization and loving care and creation, but then somehow at the same time we see natural disasters and man-made disasters and earthquakes and the Bible has a way of putting it um, so aptly when, it, when the Bible says the whole of creation is groaning. Isn't that what we feel like? We look around and we think it's so beautiful and in some ways it's so perfect. And yet in other ways, it just seems like it's groaning. It's groaning. And the Bible teaches us that all of this groaning um, has, it has an outcome. There's a, there's a future and that future is one day, you know, Jesus, sometimes the Bible says Jesus is going to come back. Sometimes it just says Jesus is going to be revealed. And both of those are true. He is going to come back, but he's already here through his spirit. So in some ways, all we need is for Jesus to be revealed. He's right here in this room. And, you know, on a certain day, we won't have to know that by faith. There's going to be a time when we will just see him all the time. And... Um, but one of the things that's also going to happen when Jesus returns is the, those who are actually the sons and daughters of God are also going to be revealed. They're also going to be revealed. Everybody is going to be, all of creation, the angels and everybody is going to be able to see these are the ones who walked faithfully. These are the ones who now are in their new bodies just as Jesus has a new body. These are the ones who will, you know, rule all of creation along with, along with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And um, so that's an amazing thing. And he says, you know, he says there's a sense. Now, obviously, he's, now he's, he's, he's personalizing for the sake of, it's just imagery. Obviously, he doesn't mean that the earth beneath us or the trees out there um, are actually groaning, you know or that they actually have some kind of a mind um, in which they're imagining one day the sons of God being revealed. It's a picture, you know. But all of these, whatever, trees and planets and stars, they will, in a sense, be witness to that great thing happening. 
you know. And, um, and, uh, but he says, that, he says that just as it seems like creation is groaning, there is also a very real sense in which we are groaning. And that is, isn't that a daily experience for many of us? There's, there's a side of us where we sense the nearness and the goodness of God. And then there's a side of us that is very, very aware of the struggle that we have against sin and against, you know, our, our own um, doubts and fears. Isn't that real to each one of us? And, and he says, hey, that's, that's also, you know, that, that's, that causes us sometimes to not know what to pray for. But he says, he says, you know, if you feel that sense of, you know, you're praying and there's a part of you that longs for the, you know, the ultimate purity and goodness of God to completely fill your life, but it's not there yet. You know, what you may be feeling when you feel that is the Holy Spirit himself. Because he says the Spirit himself from inside of you kind of groans. And in that, in that, in that wordless communication, the Spirit in some way is talking to the Father. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And they're all there helping you out. Um, so that's a very good reason to pray. You know, even when we don't know what to pray or how to pray, I don't know how many times it has helped me to know I might not know exactly what to say, but I'm comforted by the fact that God in me knows how to talk to God outside of me, and together, they're helping me out. They're helping me out. They've got my back. They've got my front. All right? Doesn't, you know, in, b before we use that language, David said, you hem me in. Behind and before, that means in modern, in modernese, that means he's got my back and he's got my front and he's got my inside, all right? And so, um, you know, um, let, think about that. And as you think about that, let it be an encouragement to us. The Bible says, hey, let's pray without ceasing. Let's give thanks in all circumstances. Let's rejoice always. And that seems so daunting. But if we think about the fact that God himself is helping us, it makes it a little easier. All right, here we go. Look at this. This is what I found. If you look very carefully, that is a cactus with its arms out like this. And there are three trees. So to me, I think of the cactus praying to a trinity. Okay. And that was just in the neighborhood on one of my, on one of my prayer walks. It is very different from what you see in West London. Point, whatever it is, the next point, ask and you will receive. Okay, just, hey, listen, uh, just an encouragement. Yes, m m a lot of our time with God is, is we're, we're trying to submit to God. We're trying to, you know, get our minds to be trusting. We're trying to accept, you know, God in our lives and what he wants. But God also says, ask. And so we should ask. We should ask, you know. Um, Ask and you'll receive, and in fact, in one place Jesus says, your joy will be complete, or your joy will be full. The purpose that he has for us is joy. In fact, he says, I want my joy to be in you. And uh, that's the God we have, okay? It's not just about grinding it out. He wants us to have his joy in us. Um, the Bible says God knows what we need before we ask, but still he wants us to ask, you know, just as a parent might know what a child wants or needs before they ask, but still it's good for the child to ask. And, um, you know, one, one, this is a, uh, when I was a, a kid, I don't know if you guys read this comic, um, or, or saw the cartoon of, uh, the Beep Beep the Roadrunner and, and Wiley Coyote. All right, so they're, they're all there, like in Arizona and in, in Southern California, where our relatives live. That, all that desert area, that's where roadrunners and coyotes live. So I specifically prayed that I, that, I, that, I would, that I would see a roadrunner and a coyote, and I was hoping to get them in the same photo. And uh, God didn't allow that. I did see a coyote, but I couldn't, I wasn't fast enough, to, it was a little bit distant, so I couldn't get a photo. But this roadrunner, this is what the real roadrunner looks like. 
What? Yeah. While I was out, while I was out praying one day, it walked up. It was like ten feet away, and it was like it didn't run away. It's kind of, it just kind of stood there, and I was like, "This is awesome, man!" I, it, it posed for me so I could take a photograph, and and uh, but uh, I did specifically ask, and I received, and uh, that was awesome. And uh, something I didn't ask for, but but got was this was this hawk as well. That's the back the back garden of my um, sister-in-law and brother-in-law's house. And this amazing hawk or falcon or whatever it is, you know, came and, and, and landed right there. And, you know, my, um, my brother-in-law had showed me his photographs and told me, hey, you know, I got this is really great out here. And, and within a day, um, this fella came and posed for me as well. So God knew what I wanted before I even asked, all right? And uh, it was awesome. Um, Next point, don't be deceived. Lessons from the desert. Don't be deceived. Okay, uh, we, we are in a spiritual war. And uh, so, yeah, so even, even, in, even being away, far away, and uh, being technically on a holiday, I was still aware in many different ways of the spiritual war that, that, that rages, you know? I was aware of my own temptations. I was aware of challenges in that church, just as we have challenges in our church. I was aware of, you know, individual um, struggles that people had and uh, you know um, um, even when we're on holiday l let's not take a holiday from God because we certainly won't be taking a holiday from the devil yeah. he's, he's going to be there right so we might as well um, be close to God 1, 1 Peter 5 8 says be alert and of sober mind your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Okay, this is a flower in the desert and it looks a bit like a lily, but it is called the devil's trumpet. It's called the devil's trumpet. Okay, this was out in, we went, uh, we went with a few friends a couple of hours away from Phoenix up to where it's a little bit cooler in a place called Sedona. And uh, we saw lots of beautiful rock formations, and we also saw the most interesting. We saw the, you know, agarve um, plant, which is what tequila is made from, you know. We saw junipers, which is what gin is made from. I'm like, man, all kinds of alcohol is in this desert, you know, in the plant. But this is called the devil's trumpet because it's so deceitful. It looks very pretty. It looks a bit like a lily growing in a desert. But if you go and go close and if you sniff it, and worse still, if for some reason you put a petal in your mouth or something, um, there are people who have gone, you know, it attacks your nerves and numbs you, and there are people who have gone catatonic, you know, like completely numbed out, you know, um, because of this, and it's called the devil's trumpet because um, it is so deceitful, all right? It is so deceitful, it looks so attractive, and that's the nature of sin. It starts off so appealing, but it ends up so appalling, isn't it? And uh, so uh, I won't say too much about that, but that was a lesson from the desert. And then finally, you know, delight in God's people. In Psalm 16, the psalmist says, as for the saints who are in the land, um, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight, you know. Um, I couldn't help it. Was, it was great still being connected to you guys on WhatsApp, you know, and, and, and I t there was one or two of you I even talked to even while I was away. And, uh, but but um, you've had this experience too, you know, we visit another church in another country with another culture with most people who you don't know, but somehow there's still a, there's still a commonality. You still, you know, because you have the same Lord and you have the same priorities, you know, you're fighting the same battle you're relying on the same God, um, there's a sense of family and brotherhood. And, um, you know, that was a real joy. Um, this final photograph is, you know, three, three of us couples, we've, this is, uh, some of you have seen the Fontenot. I thank God for all of you. Um, you know, uh, I thank God for the brothers who, who, uh, who uh, you know, who take care of me um, here, in, here in West London. I thank God for the, the many encouragements of, you know, that, I, that I get on text or, or phone or WhatsApp whenever, I, whenever I'm anywhere. Um, I thank God for the people who ask me how I'm doing. 
you know, how marriage is going and how my inner life is going. Um, or, or who just want to go out and, 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 and get a drink, you know, because I, I need that too. And, um, uh, you know, th- thank the Lord uh, it, because, you know, we live in a, our, our own neighbors, um, there, there are probably many of our, of our own neighbors who live, in a, who live in a crowded neighborhood of many, many houses, but who don't have, you know, who don't have a single close, close friend. The, 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 the couple that we're staying with, you know, uh, Will and Leanne, uh, I think maybe, while, maybe just a few days before we arrived, just God had worked it out that Will bumped into a friend of his that he hadn't seen since university. And he's, he's my age. Okay, so he bumped into a friend he hadn't seen since university. But then um, he, he had them come over to hear, hear me preach and uh, then fellowship with them. And, and w- one of the things that turned out is that, uh, his friend Scott and, and his wife Diane, they go to another church, which is one of these... It's like a, you know, a mega church with, I don't know, 38,000 members and different campuses and, you know, all that. And um, one of the things she said was, I don't have a single close friend. I don't have a single close friend. Because they, they, they go to church, they hear sermons, and they leave, you know. There's no small group. There's no discipling that's organized. There's no friendship. And what's the point? You know, what's the point? Um, and so, I'm so, I just wanted to end saying, I know I'm, I'm grateful that in spite of, uh, you know, like I said, all the ups and downs. If you hang around uh, with God for any length of time, you're going to have ups and downs. There are times you're going to love church. There are times you're not going to love church. You know, there are times um, that are going to be great and there are times that are just going to be testing. Um, but, um, but the test of anything good is, does it last? And... You know, to, to be able to look back over many years and say, well, God has been with me, but there are, there are people that I know um, th- that are so close. Um, that's, a, that's not to be taken for granted. Amen. And so let's, let's delight in God's people. And uh, uh, is anybody doing closing and announcements? Are there any announcements? No slides. No slides, no announcements. Let's pray then. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll do announcements on Sunday. God, it's great to pray. Uh, thank you, God, for bringing us back safely. Thank you for all the brothers and sisters that are here. Um, thank you, God, for giving us one another. And uh, Lord, uh, help us, Lord, to hold each other's arms up as we fight that battle, as we um, try to stay clear of Satan's deceptions. Um, as we rejoice in your creation and in your goodness and your nearness to us. Uh, thank you so much, Lord. Send us home and help us get a, uh, a, a you know, help us, have, help us get home safely and sleep well. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.